Five, a show where we count things down from number five all the way to number one. And this week, a suggestion, I think, from our Discord channel. Top five directors. And I will say that this is pretty tough because I ended up with ten. And then I had to shuffle them around so I could get five. I had to stretch and go look at my favorite movies and see if they had directors. Well, so <laughs> yeah, so that's a couple of things that I had to do was, uh, you know, in, in some cases I went, you know, these are all personal. So, uh, again, with every top five list, this is not some definitive, this is the written in stone the way it is and the way everyone must also think. But well, when actually, I was, mine are that. But no. Uh, but when I was going through, I was like, okay, what are the movies that I will watch consistently again and again and again? And who are those directors? And that's how I had to get my, my list narrowed down. Now, I'm not saying all these directors are great, uh, but they are my top five directors just because I end up watching their movies all the time. Now right. I have to go back in my head and see who directed the movies that I know you love. Um, you might be surprised on my list uh, because uh, I know my number one should be fairly easy to uh, figure out because I'll have a but I'll have a big asterisk by it. Uh, but the oh, ones yeah. that you guys will think that I'm going to say probably are in my the, six through ten list. The ones that you think Steven's going to say you might are get not right. on the list, right? Because he hates that they did certain movies he hates. <laughs> so that knocks them down. Well, in the case well, of my number one, that's where the big asterisk comes from, right? Yep. Uh, so, I like, I know so like George, so like George Lucas, not in my top five. Right, right. Well, no, he's not a good director. <laughs> no, he's not. no one, no one said, no one said this was a list of good directors, Matthew. These are our <laughs> list of top five, top five. directors. That's true. And Rodrigo, right. why don't you start us off with your number five? Okay. Um, so my number five is kind of to um, to get everyone used to what's going to happen here because this Old school guy. Yeah, well, it's not just not just that. Although there is some of that, but um, all everybody that ended up on this list, except maybe one, has a really big, intense visual style. Mm, mm -hmm. It's. Most of these directors, you can look at them and say, ah, yes, this is a Terry Gilliam. And my number five is Terry Gilliam. Oh, yes. Um, you know, uh, Baron Munchausen, uh, assorted Monty Python stuff. Brazil. Brazil. Oh, God, Brazil. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't, uh, most of these guys, I actually haven't seen all of their movies, but kind of the, the criteria for me was, can I name two movies by this person? Mm -hmm. And did I like both of them? Or can I name enough movies by this person that I like? And do I like what they do? And that's that the, the, the thing about Terry Gilliam is that he is really great at creating both sort of um, emotional and physical space. A lot of his movies, especially his early stuff takes place in sound stages. Um, but there is something about it that makes the world either seem appropriately claustrophobic or bigger than what you're seeing. Um, and uh, same thing with kind of the, the character's emotions. There's always kind of something else to it. There's I, it's like broad and theatrical, but at the same time, there's kind of a, you know, subtlety and a message. So yeah, my number five, Terry Gilliam. For years, Terry was attached to Watchmen. And I so want to see Terry Gilliam's eight-hour Watchmen movie. I think I could actually sit through that and just stare at the film and not even care what's going on. Just look at it and, and let it wash over you like a well, calming yeah. breeze well, as you drown. You also have well, to remember that the Terry Gilliam Watchmen was going to have Robin Williams in it. And, right. um, gosh, yeah. uh, uh, what's his name uh, when he was the Shadow? And... Uh, Oh, Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin at the younger age. Robin Williams age. would be good in in Watchmen. You have uh, Watchmen. Robin. Robin Williams would have been a pretty fantastic comedian if if that's what they were going to no, cast. No, he as. wasn't going for the comedian. He was oh, going really? for Rorschach. Um, see, I could see a Robin Williams Rorschach, especially if you've sure. seen him in um, this was the be, Fisher this King. was before the Fisher King, which yeah. was interesting because that's a Terry Gilliam movie as well. So right, right, right. Yeah. All right. My number five. Uh, is Kevin Smith. And I know people are like, what? Kevin Smith is on the uh, list and not Quentin Tarantino or Christopher Nolan or George Lucas. But you put Kevin Smith on the list. And the reason why Kevin Smith is on the list is because uh, 
he, for me, represents one of those directors that is the everyman, right? That uh, here's this guy who dropped out of film school, uh, spent all the money that he had and credit cards to create clerks. And it's a truly funny, independent movie that speaks to people of Kevin Smith's age and Kevin Smith's generation. And I remember uh, when this movie came out, my friend Brian was like, uh, have you seen this Clerks movie yet? And I'm like, no. And he's like, you got to go and rent it from the video store. You know, back in the day, kids, you used to go and rent the movies that you wanted to see from an actual store. And they used to come check this out on a cassette sized thing. <laughs> About uh, what? About eight inches by four inches. And you had to slide it into a machine and hope that the tape, yes, this little celluloid stuff inside would not be crinkled or ruined as you played it back. And it was a pretty bad quality. And yet we rented these things in mass. But uh, my friend Brian and I finally got a copy of Clerks and sat down. And it was one of these changing moments of no, not only is this funny and crude humor and whatever but here is this person that's doing something in black and white doing something cheaply because they believe in it and i think and even since clerks even though kevin smith has had some ups and downs and some of his movies have not been uh, great at all and some of them have been passing uh, i think he still represents that little engine that could that everybody can be a director if they just have an idea and a vision and a way of telling that story and a passion of telling that story so kevin smith is on my list simply because of the passion. Kevin and, and Smith is my number three. Oh, okay, go ahead. What, what do you want to say about Kevin Smith? The thing about Smith that I really love, and this is something, you know, coming from someone who watched Kevin Smith's work from 1994 all the way through 2011, when all of a sudden I couldn't get his movies anymore because they were all like streaming things that you can only get, you know, online in Canada or something. Kevin Smith, and it's remarkable that we both have him because we are exactly the same age as Kevin Smith. And when you talk about sometimes this person is the voice of a generation, Kevin Smith in a lot of ways, you know, there are other directors like Richard Linklater you could throw in there as well, but yeah, definitely. very, very much the voice of a generation that was 22, 23, 24 in the early nineties, the, and, the people Stevens age and, and, and even more importantly in the nineties, when the only thing that was really being produced were major studio films. Uh, right. Yes, you could go down the the cheap route and go to a little minor studio and maybe get something distributed only on video. But that was kind of sketchy to do. And there weren't budgets and they look like they didn't have budgets. And Kevin Smith made his little budget go a long ways. And Kevin Smith is... This is not necessarily a selling point to everybody, but for me, Kevin Smith is one of those directors who doesn't just have visual touches in his films, but there are in-jokes, and there are, there are references to other movies, references to his previous movies, references to characters that you've seen. A Kevin Smith film is just full of, hey, it's that guy, and full of, here's an Easter egg, and full of, this is a reference to that one line about halfway through that one other movie that you saw. You know, in a lot of ways that you see in, in modern filmmaking, that that mashup of I'm going to do this whole scene and it's going to look exactly like a scene that, you know, Gus Van Zandt did when he did a scene that was exactly like Hitchcock. That's what Kevin Smith really means to me is Kevin Smith's movies are not just visually fascinating. They're fun to sit there and pick apart in your head and go, hey, what's all this? You know, there's there's one moment in Clerks. Uh, that I think is one of my favorite movie moments of all time. And he refers to it as the only special effect in the whole movie where, because it was made for like $27,000, they actually have a scene where a guy looks down from the roof of the quick stop and yells at a guy. No, we're not open. And both characters are played by the same man. Mm -hmm. uh, his, uh, his director, Dave, or his technical director, his camera operator, whatever, baby Dave, he's got a beard at in one sequence, which we saw earlier, and then he shaved to play the other character. So there's literally a shot of a man yelling at himself, and if you don't know it, you don't recognize it. And it's really well constructed, and it's really great to see someone that young, someone that limited in resources, doing all these really bizarre, weird, clever things that Kevin would go on to do and he'd keep doing them, even though he had money and resources and a big name. He keeps doing these things that are fun and fascinating well, to look at and just kind of go, hey, look at that. Well, not just fun and fascinating things to look at, but he's also doing it because he's like, 
hey, here's a story that I want to tell. I want to tell some Canadians Jaws, you know, a moose meets Jaws. <laughs> and I'm going to tell that story and I'm probably sure it's going to tank, which it did. But I'm going to go and do it and have fun. And yeah, so he's kind of got a um, he hasn't I think he's earned an FU reputation, even though he doesn't have FU money. Um, right. And so he just does it. And he's got a large enough tribe that will flock around him that helps cover those costs and actually makes some, many of his movies, even the bad ones, profitable for him. Yeah. So, well, define the bad ones. Are you talking about Jersey Girl? Uh, well, I'm specifically talking about the the Moose Jaws. What was that called? I don't know. That was bad. Yeah. Tu- was no, no, no. Tusk? That's not Tusk. It's not Tusk. tusk There's is literally. The one with the walrus. Yeah, that's oh, the walrus. Oh, sorry. One. I got the, my northern yeah, different, animal different monster order. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, Tusk was actually really weird, but uh, what was it? Red State was the one that was kind of where people kind of woke up and said, oh, wait, Kevin Smith can't tell different kind of stories. So uh, Kevin Smith was just a brain squeezer for me. My number five, Matthew's number three. Matthew, what is your number five? (laughs) Yeah, I get two in a row. My number five is on this list for one movie and one movie only. And that movie is something that I reference all the time. Ma. And you will hear me occasionally say or tweet, or you know, if you are behind me in traffic, you'll hear me sing song and going, one of us, one of us. And that is a line from a 1932 movie called Freaks, directed by Todd Browning. And the thing about a Todd Browning film is that it will keep you from sleeping for days and days and days. Uh, the thing that I know him from other than Freaks primarily is the 1931, maybe, Dracula movie, that first Bela Lugosi Dracula film. Mm-hmm. But uh, Todd was around during the early, early, early silent film days and did just a whole bunch of these you know, amped up dramas and weird horror films and kind of slid into this kind of a reputation as a horror guy or a visual horror guy at a time where all of the language of filmmaking was still being written. So when you talk about a movie like Freaks, he also did one called Iron Man, which I think is awesome because then you can go, yeah, Robert Downey Jr., 1932. But if you look at Freaks, Freaks is a movie that I first saw in the middle of the night when I was like 17 or 18 years old, it was just something that popped up and I could not stop watching. I could not stop looking at this film and you couldn't make this movie today. And I don't mean that in, Oh, they wouldn't do it. I mean, legally they would not allow you to make this movie today because he literally got a bunch of people who worked in the circuses and were there to be circus freaks, which is a terrible phrase and a terrible term, but it's also the title of the film. And he played it straight, and he treated them like people. And there is one sequence in that movie that still gives me chills just talking about it in a fully lit room on a Tuesday afternoon. Is it the, is scene, it the little worm person coming at you with the knife? Yes, the man with the knife in his teeth. You know, the, he's, she's running, and the lightning is going on, and it's raining, and there's mud. And she falls, and she looks down, and under a wagon is a man crawling towards her, no arms, no legs, with a knife in his teeth. And it's horrifying. And then you think... What's he going to do with that knife? And then your brain kind of exhales a minute. And then you think, wait, what's he going to do with that knife? And your brain tightens up again. And it's just a horrifying moment that is funny for a second. And then you realize that it's not funny at all. And that's kind of the thing that I get out of every Todd Browning film that I've seen. Now, granted, I haven't seen all of them because he made like 11 scriptillion movies. But even if you've only ever seen Freaks, even if you've only ever seen Dracula, even if you've only ever seen London After Midnight, you will know that I am correct when I pick Todd Browning. It's one of my top five movie directors ever. All right, there ever, you go. Ever, ever. Rodrigo, what do you have for your number four? Uh, my number four is probably the most uh, subtle director in my list. Less of a, of a big, obvious um, visual style. But... Um, I've seen a few of her movies, and I liked all the ones that I've seen. And uh, really, I think she's a good director because of the performance that she gets from the actors. And that's Penny Marshall. Oh, man, she is my number 10. She's my number four. Oh, well, there you go. Ma- <laughs> man, Matthew with the combos. <laughs> go ahead. Talk. Yeah, Penny Marshall, right? Uh, uh 
because I was thinking, what movies do I like? And very early on, A League of, Our Own, A League mm-hmm. of Their Own came up. Um, and it is, uh, you know, when you talk about like quintessential sports movies, you know, people are going to bring up Remember the Titans. People are going to bring up um, Field, Field of, of Dreams, Dreams yeah. Rudy. But A League of Their Own really kind of sets the kind of sets the standard for that type of movie where you have like a dysfunctional team that has to come together um, while also dealing with external pressures. Right. And the, it, it really shines because it's a mostly female cast. It really shines because the external uh, issues are, are real things that actually happen and that people are still dealing with today. Um, and, you know, it, it has a lot of heart. It has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it can, it can go, seamlessly back and forth between you know right down slapstick humor to all the way to like something that actually makes you start to you know tear up and um and and really feel for these characters um big is good you know i remember seeing awakenings but it was a long time ago and i Mm -hmm. I remember being like very affected by it i don't remember anything that actually happens in it but i remember having seen it as a kid and being like oh my god could this ever actually be a thing that happens to someone? The right. answer is yes. Yeah. I was confused that movie with Patch Adams. Yeah, That's because the, he's the doctor yeah, in both movies. Yeah. Robert Williams. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, Penny Marshall, great. Uh specifically big is the reason why I will put her down. Also, yep. um, um um League of Their Own, but there were a couple of others that she did that I'm just like, wow, that is That's really good. I mean, that is really good crafting of a story, really good uh, directing with actors. But Matthew, you have her on your number four list. I do have her at my number four. And the reason why, and this is going to be one of those moments where people are like, what are you smoking? The reason why is a movie called Jumpin' Jack Flash that I saw in the theater in 86. Yeah, people don't really like that movie. People are like, oh, it's a stupid movie. And it's it's all, and I get that it has some cliche moments and I get that it has some, issues it's a first time director but when you actually sit and watch that movie what it does more than anything is focus on Whoopi Goldberg doing stuff in interesting locations and i feel like harnessing that harnessing that here's an interesting character in Tom Hanks here's an interesting character in Robin Williams who's not Patch Adams here's an interesting entire group of characters uh with a league of their own she really makes it fun to just sit there and see what those people are up to. And there are points where, especially in A League of Their Own, her directing actually tricked me. Because I think, you know, I think I understand the, the rules of how movies are put together and how movies are constructed. And there's a scene in A League of Their Own where Gina Davis and her little sister Tank Girl are having a fight. And I think I know what's going on. But if you actually go back and watch it, the next scene, it's like, no, you were paying attention to the wrong thing, Matthew. The director actually tricked you into thinking that one thing was happening when something else was happening. And not in a way where it's like they didn't know what they were doing. It was a she was so focused and knew exactly what she was doing and knew how to focus my attention on the wrong thing so that I didn't realize that in that very next sequence, Tank Girl was going to go off and she was going to join another team and it was going to be a huge betrayal and literally change that whole, the whole take on the movie. I really, really like Penny Marshall simply because I always wanted to be Penny Marshall. I want to be the guy who's like, hey, just go do that and shut up. But also because that sort of laissez-faire attitude doesn't come through in the films. You really get the feeling that she's focused on everything that you're seeing, focused on things that even experienced directors wouldn't. And that's the really big part of it. Uh, I said big. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. My number four is actually a tie in that these two work together all the time, sometimes flipping back and forth between uh, roles. But every single one of their movies, I don't think there is one that I really hate, but I will watch these again and again and again. And their most recent film, uh, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, is brilliant in its execution. And I'm talking about Joel and Ethan Coen. Mm. Uh, you know, I think I really finally clicked with me back with uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? when that came out. Uh, I had seen a couple of their other movies previously. 
uh, but it just really didn't, they just didn't really click with me until Oh Brother Where Art Thou? And then it's like, you know, they've got a bunch of movies that you can just dive into. And again, there's not a single one that I won't sit down and watch and enjoy in some way, shape, or form. They're just really masters at combining sometimes absurdity with real life or coming in with a theme and making it fun, but also sending a message or just scaring the crap out of you in many instances, showing you how low people will go to get what they want or to do what they want. So they kind of show the big extremes of, of the human experience. And they've done just about every genre. They've done the musical. They've done the Western. They've done, you know, you just run down the list. They've done the, the gangster movie. They've done the thriller. They've done the screwball comedies. Uh, they're just super versatile. And that's why I put uh, Joel and Ethan Cohen as my number four top five directors. Well, number five with the mezzanine. Right, exactly. Uh, okay, we are now back around to our number threes. Rodrigo, what do you have for number three? Uh, my number three is also a director team, um, and all, and a uh, once again back to directors who have a very strong visual style, mm-hmm. and that's the Wachowskis. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. I, I think most of the time Lana Wachowski takes kind of point. I think mm-hmm. she's the, the at least the the more front facing outspoken one of the, of the directors yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah um but uh most of i think most of their credits and definitely their big credits like uh the matrix and uh you know speed racer mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. are the the Wachowski. i will i will die on the hill that speed racer is a good movie people I love speed racer people just did not get what they were going for they were hoping for a new matrix and they don't realize that they got the first speed racer and because it didn't do so well, the only speed racer, (laughs) um, again, strong visual style, kind of this, uh, uh, this idea of sort of, um, it's like form follows function times 10 million, right? It's like, uh, you, you look at the Matrix and everything's like green and computery. You look at Speed Racer, everything's like is like a cotton candy lollipop exploded mm-hmm. inside your nostrils. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's that that ability to take sort of these like very basic visual concepts and expand them and expand them and expand them until they almost break. Right. Yeah. Um, from what I've I've seen of uh, uh, what is it, Jupiter Ascending. Oh, right. Um, yeah. That probably has some of that going on. I watched it, Cloud it Atlas. Does... Cloud Atlas is downright subtle for a Wachowski movie. Hmm. I would have um, put it, I mean, I wouldn't have put it up there at the same level as Speed Racer, but it's certainly up there as far as the effects and the spectacle goes with yeah, the Matrix. And that's, and that's, and that's the deal is, uh, you mean Jupiter Ascending or Cloud Atlas? Uh, Cloud Atlas. Yeah. Cloud Atlas. I didn't, I didn't terribly like Cloud Atlas. Um, but yeah. It's like the the visuals of it are there. Mm-hmm. I just think the story of it really didn't quite translate the way they wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's hard so, when you're trying to do a, you know, a book story, a ring story, and you've only got, what, three hours or whatever to tell it. And it's really a, a movie that I, needs to be eight hours long. Yeah, I mean, very ambitious. Mm-hmm. It, it was a very ambitious project. And... It's it, it it just feels ambitious in the sense of like carrying a sheet cake without a tray. <laughs> like they're just like you can see it and they're lifting it and it's going and you just see it start to fold at the edges and you're like, oh no, movie, what are you doing? You know. Yeah. Anyway. No, no, you're. Uh, I think you're about accurate on that movie. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think so, but again, it doesn't like it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't move them any farther down. I think, again, when it comes to sort of taking basic visual concepts and sort of iterating on them until you have kind of a, a visual smorgasbord, um, I, I think the, the Wachowskis are almost unmatched. You know, I, I mean, in a list that already has Terry Gilliam on it, it tells you something. Right. Yeah. You know, back in the day, uh, people used to talk about their unproduced ideas for a Plastic Man movie. Ooh. And my God, do I wish that we had gotten a Wachowski <laughs> Plastic Man movie. Well, you still Would, might. Oh, oh, 
Oh, I'm telling you, man. I still want. I'd love to see that. I will. I will tell them. DC, I know you're out there. I can hear you. Hire the Wachowskis. Put them on plastic, man. Get it done. Yeah. All right. My number three. Um, again, might come as a surprise to many, maybe not for others, but it is Akira Kurosawa. Ooh. And the reason why he is on the list is for the time period. When you think of, you know, some of his great films, Seven Samurai, I think, is the one that everybody knows uh, that has been redone into, you know, the uh, the Magnificent Seven here in the United States. Yojimbo was done and turned into... Uh, the man with no name, uh, you know, uh, a fistful of dollars. Fistful of dollars, yeah. And then you also have Rashomon, which is just this fantastic story of, you know, what's real, what's not. Let's tell this same story from multiple perspectives until we find out the truth. All these movies done, except for Yojimbo, done before 1960. Mm. And you think about the spectacle of how detailed and how epic and how burned into your mind the visuals from just those three or four movies that I've mentioned are and how they influenced American slash Western cinema afterwards. I mean, these are film school generation people that saw this and suddenly turned around and said, oh, we want to make these these things. There's something here about, uh, you know, we may have to watch a translation, but the visuals alone can tell a fantastic story. And Kurosawa just does it magnificently. And for the most part, always in black and white. And, you know, we wouldn't have Clint Eastwood where he is today if it wasn't for Akira Kurosawa. We wouldn't have George Lucas if it wasn't for Akira Kurosawa. Uh, And so for that reason, I think he deserves to be on the list of directors. And I could watch Seven Samurai again and again and again. I can watch Yojimbo multiple times without getting tired of of that movie. Uh, So therefore, Akira Kurosawa, my number three. Ever seen Kagemusha? I don't think I have. I mean, he's got a huge list of movies as a director. He, I mean, he was in working from 1941 to 1993. Yeah. 50 years of films. Now, he doesn't have 50 films. He's only got 33 directing credits. Uh, but uh, some of these movies you can only get, I think, via the Criterion co- Collection, uh, or you have to belong to that service, wherever the Criterion uh, service is. So I haven't <laughs> seen, you know, half of his films. And that's okay. Out on the internet. Because the four or five that are really, really good are really, really good. And you're going to see him. I mean, even today, his influence is felt today for a movie that is almost uh, getting on to 80 years old. So that's really, really cool. All right. We are whipping around to our number twos at the moment. And Rodrigo, what do you have for your number two? Uh, My number two is going to be... Uh, now that you've sort of seen my list and and where it's going, it's, it's probably not going to be a big surprise. Um, my number two is Guillermo del Toro. Mm-hmm. Uh, so del Toro uh, has kind of a, uh, similarly to the Wachowskis, is able to kind of take um, uh, visual concepts and sort of expand them. But uh, Guillermo del Toro does this thing where He's able to have very fantastical things interact with very mundane things. Right. And the experience is enhanced for it. Right. It's like anywhere from the 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 kind of back and forth between the real world and the fawns world in Pan's Labyrinth, uh, the the fish man um, sort of like hanging out in like a very normal bathtub. Uh, in sh- uh, Shape of Water, or, you know, that scene where the giant mech uh, arm punches through an entire <laughs> office yeah. to set off that, uh, what is that called? Like that little uh, back and forth, little knocking together ball thing. Um, the something it a, cradle. It has an, yeah, it's a something cradle, but I don't, I don't remember whose cradle it is. Uh, let's say, I don't know. It's, it's not a cat's stuff. cradle, that's Vonnegut. But anyway... Um. Yeah, Guillermo del Toro, uh, I, I it, like it has this ability to make, and especially if you've seen some of his horror stuff, mm-hmm. uh, to make the, the vampire one is really good. Yeah. Um. If you've seen Mama, if you've seen God, what is it like? The Spine or something. Uh, what is it? <laughs> Well, anyway, um, 
he has this ability to make very mundane things very scary. Um, and, you know, if you've seen Hellboy to make very scary things kind of hilarious. Mm-hmm. So, um, <laughs> again, somebody who can transition very easily between these two spaces of, like, spooky, spooky monster and very mundane situations and draw out a lot of horror, a lot of humor, a lot of heart out of, out of that transition. Mm-hmm. Didn't he do a Blade movie? Did he do one of the oh, blades? He did, he did blade two. Yeah, he did blade two. Yeah. yeah. Is that the is that the one with the the vampires that like open up? I think it is. Uh, or is that, up, that, that makes sense. I don't remember the blades all just sort of blend together. It's like, hey, here's <laughs> hey, a hey, Daywalker, you know, we must blood. kill you. Oh no, you won't. Yeah. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. Bang bang boom boom. Miss Noxima Jackson has a sword. I ye. Yeah. But yeah, it's a good movie. Yep. Uh my number two. I was surprised that he landed on my number two, and then I went down the list of films that he has directed, and sure enough, these are movies that I have watched again and again and again, and I've specifically made my wife watch a movie when she was sick or had a day off or something. I think she was sick, so she was at home, and I was like, here, watch this movie, and I just watched it just to watch her freak out when uh, things started to go really, really weird. He's directed television. Mindhunter is a fantastic Uh, television series he's done zodiac uh, which is about the zodiac killer which again i will revisit that probably about every two years or so and just be drawn into it like what is this movie of course he's got fight club he's got the game he's got i mean just so much on his list david fincher is a really really good director and i dig his stuff man I just uh, the precision and the uh, I don't want to say I mean, it is a craft, but the precision and the expectation of this is what I want. And we're going to redo it again until uh, we get it right is just wow, that's neat, Uh, especially when you look at the social network and how many times they had to do certain scenes over and over again because somebody made a noise at just the wrong time. Or you look at in the case of Mindhunter, how he will go in and digitally recreate Uh, scenes that aren't perfect so that the timing is perfect and he expects his actors to deliver the lines exactly as they are written no ad-libbing no deviation because that is how the film is supposed to be made and i don't know there's something about every single one of his films is really 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 good uh so that's why he is on my list and at number two which i was really surprised because i was expecting someone like quentin tarantino or I was expecting someone like, um, uh, what's his name, who did uh, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels oh, to be Guy on Ritchie. that list. Guy Ritchie to be on my list. English Mr. Madonna McChinson. Yeah, didn't. Well, I think they've been <laughs> divorced still, for. I don't think no, they've, they've been anymore. divorced for like a decade, so it, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, I'm a little behind. Yeah, yeah, you are. Uh, Matthew, do you have? Did we do a number two for you, or do you have a number two that we haven't gotten? To I yet? have. The number two. All right. Well, the, Let's share your number two with all of us. Since my very first entry. And this is another one that really it comes from one sort of, I don't know if you'd call it a latchkey film. Um, but when I was younger, I didn't have cable. And my wife and I had a whole bunch of those videotapes, as Stephen used to talk about, that we would watch at night in order to go to bed. Now, our house howled. Uh, this is true. It was poorly insulated, so the wind would blow and the house would go, and it would sound like monsters coming to eat her. So we would distract her with a movie, and one of the movies was Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Yeah. And uh, in retrospect, it's probably not that much more comforting than thinking the house is going to eat you. But it is fascinating, and it does bring you into the world of Steven Soderbergh. And what Mm -hmm. Soderbergh does, I think, better than anybody else is just put characters out and show us their, for lack of a better word, their human condition. You have, throughout that movie, you have characters doing reprehensible things, saying and doing and being terrible things. And yet there is no one in that movie that you don't empathize with. There is no one in Sex, Lies, and Videotape that you don't feel a little bit of heart for. Even Peter Gallagher and his eyebrows. Uh, who are two separate people and should be credited as such. 
But if you go through his career after that movie, everybody's like, we love this movie, we want more Soderbergh. And it's like five movies where he's like, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to focus on this little story. And people are like, we hate this. We hate this. We hate this for like five movies in a row. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, Ocean's Eleven hits. Yeah, what's, you get... what's interesting about Soderbergh is very early on, he not only got the FU uh, credentials like Kevin Smith did, yeah. but, he, but he also had the FU money. To where he's oh. like, oh, yeah, I'll go do an Ocean's Eleven when I feel like I need to do Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> but all the rest of the time, I'm going to do these little films that I'm going to release the same day on a, a DVD as it does in theater and, and piss the, 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 the motion picture industry off and, yeah. and do these, these little things. And then you run into, yeah, Ocean's Eleven. Yep. And right about that same time, in the space of like two years, he did Aaron Brockovich mm -hmm. and Traffic and The Limey. Mm -hmm. And I really think about, for me... Uh, my favorite is Sex, Lies, and Videotape, but I think the quintessential Soderbergh movie is Ocean's 13, where you look at that, he's like, I'm building on two previous movies, and I've literally got 37 main characters, and one of our subplots is the less talented Affleck and George C. Scott's grandson starting a revolution in Mexico. And it's so entertaining to just see him juggling these 37 main characters and some of them are half asleep i mean throughout that whole movie george clooney is just like i'm taking a nap you guys just act around me but it works and yeah. you really come out of that movie feeling like yes go danny go all you other ass clowns sorry now uh, matthew if, if you love the oceans 11 films yes then there's I a do. soderbergh movie that you have to watch called logan lucky it's essentially Ocean's Eleven, but for NASCAR. <laughs> and that's literally, no, that, is literally that. that is literally the, the hook for this movie. It's like Ocean's Eleven meets NASCAR. It has... Um, is that like brand it, new? No, it came out in 2017. It's got... Uh, Dude, uh, that's, brand, that's brand new for Matthew. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's hey, right. Yeah, yeah. You don't have <laughs> yeah. to say it like that. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. It's got Channing Tatum in it. It's got um, uh, Katie Holmes in it. It's Adam got, Driver. yeah, it's got, uh, yeah, Adam Driver in it. Seth MacFarlane is in it. Uh, oh, well, what's his name? Um, 007. 007? Yeah, it's Daniel, got 007. Daniel Craig? Yeah, it's got Daniel Craig in it. It is, it's really good. And I didn't realize that it was Soderbergh until I was like halfway through the movie. I was like, man, this is just Ocean's Eleven again. And I was like, let me look this up. I was like, holy crap, this is Steven Soderbergh. And he's doing whatever the heck he wants to do. And it's when you realize, and that's one of the nice things about these directors that we have on our list. If one of these directors calls you up and says, hey, I'm doing a movie. Would you like to be in it? You don't go, hmm, yeah, go talk to my agent. It's like, yeah, I'm going to drop everything and go do this. And that's how you get Daniel yeah. Craig to play uh, hillbilly uh, uh, redneck busting out of jail in Logan Lucky. Wow. I may have to look. Into yeah, that. no, you definitely need to go look it up. It's it is so fascinating. But again. Because they didn't, they played up the Adam Driver and they played up the Daniel Craig bits on it. They didn't the, play the up Channing the, Tatum. I remember there being yeah. Channing they Tatum. they didn't play up the Steven Soderbergh angle on this, and so this is one of those that flew under the radar for so many people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is surprising. I mean, uh, I, so they played up the part that it was from the director of Magic Mike. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, it and it is. Yeah. But it is. Well, I'm just saying. But yeah. So yeah, I may have to go. I'll just go watch that now. I'll see you guys later. All right. Uh, so that is your number two. So I think that is now, my number two. So I think we are now up to our number ones. Yeah. And Rodrigo, what do you have for your number one? Uh, my number one is it was it was actually very tough for me to to order this this list, um, and it it kind of came down to. If somebody is like, hey, you got to watch a movie right now, which of these directors' movies would you rather watch right now, right at this moment? I know that I'm going to be in the mood to watch an Edgar Wright movie mm -hmm. more often than anybody else on this list. Mm -hmm. probably, probably because they're generally pretty light and fast, right? Um, your Shaun of the Deads, your Scott Pilgrims. Uh, I still haven't seen Baby Driver. Oh, you haven't? Okay. Well, I, I, I want to. Be prepared. It's it's yeah. a very dark movie, but it's also now got a bad stigma to it, so. Oh, does it? Yeah, because of one of the actors that's in it. Oof. 
Mm. All right. Well, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Got, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so anyway, uh, yes, Edgar Wright. Um, someone who um, is, you, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, Matthew brought up the, the potential of somebody, uh, you know, doing a plastic man. Edgar Wright was uh, actually working, directing Ant-Man. Mm -hmm. the uh the marvel Mm -hmm. ant-man movie Mm -hmm. and they were like marvel was like this is not what we want and they split up on uh, creative differences i believe yes they did because just because he wanted something a little bit lighter and more fun Mm -hmm. and they were like oh no you can't you can't do that yeah i think and then thor ragnarok comes out and marvel's like oh wait we can do that can't we yeah i think um you know, Ant Man is solidly in that space, that second wave, um, where it's like we is like this is what Marvel movies are now. Also, other movies in that space, Thor: The Dark World, which is not a good movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's like there's this thing where they the Marvel universe kicks off by having these big names. Um, well, first John Favreau and turning him into a big name. Um, but then, you know, you have Kenneth Branagh directing Thor and you have like basically all these other people coming in and directing this stuff. And they wanted to do that with um, Edgar Wright. And then when he turned around and he was like, OK, here's my big, crazy vision that you hired me for. They were like, no, we want a Marvel movie. <laughs> um, so anyway, what could have been uh, what I like about him is that he is very good at establishing a. Um, kind of a visual language for a movie, and it often comes with, from transitions. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like transition and repetition is kind of the the name of of the game. Um, definitely with the ones that I like the most, which are Shaun of the Dead and Scott Pilgrim, right? Yep. Um, and Shaun of the Dead is like when Shaun tells you exactly how the plan is going to go, you see it over and over. I mean, Shaun of the Dead is sort of like will beat you to death with repetition but that's that's the movie right it's like that movie is like a perfect circle everything you ever see in the movie is going to come back around again in a different way it's sort of like uh um you know lin-manuel miranda with his reprises um (laughs) it's just you're you're gonna hear the same thing again and it's gonna make you feel something different and you didn't even see it coming and i i feel like that's that's like uh, Edgar Wright can do that with swish pans, yeah. you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, you know, his movies tend to be lighter, tend to be funny, tend to be fast. And so it's, it's just fun to sit down with a popcorn flick and watch it all the way through and, uh, have a, have a good time. Yep. 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 Good, good choice for your number one. Uh, my number one probably shouldn't come as a big surprise for most people when it comes to movies and this top five uh, list show that we do, because my number one is Steven Spielberg with a big old asterisk, because there are Steven Spielberg. There are periods in Steven Spielberg's directing career that I'm just like, oh, my God, he is the greatest ever. And that would be everything from uh, Jaws, with the exception of uh, 1941, all the way through uh, essentially Indiana Jones and the Last Last Crusade, right? So there is almost a decade's worth of, or a decade and a half's worth of content that he generated. I mean, Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, uh, uh, amazing stories on television, uh, you know, just Jaws, uh, just these great, 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 great movies. And the thing that I like about that period is there's a lot of controlled chaos in a Steven Spielberg movie from the you know, the se- in the 70s and early 80s, where there is just so much noise and action. I think the best is when you look at Close Encounters of the Third Kind, one of my favorite movies, and you see the scene inside of their home. And these kids are just constantly making noise and banging things and tearing things. And there's junk and everything that's around. And it just makes that world feel lo- lived in. And for all of the characters in those movies in that time period, we also see this um, path of discovery where each of these characters, whether it's Indiana Jones discovering that, you know, uh, ancient artifacts may indeed have religious meanings or going out and finding a great white, white shark, or, Hey, there's a alien living in my, in my bedroom. These all have this kind of chaotic quest for 
something new of discovery that's going on. And then we hit Hook in 91. And I liked Hook at first. There was something about it that didn't sit right with me. And I just realized that he was trying to recapture some of the crazy maniac noise filled, you know, uh, controlled chaos from his other films. And it just didn't work for me. And so the, the shine on Steven Spielberg just kind of, of waned for me. But then he came back. He had Jurassic Park, which I thought was good, but also crazy controlled chaos. You had Schindler's List, a very, very good movie. Uh, and then as I look at all these movies, they kind of go up and down. Artificial intelligence, a, a real dud for me. Minority Report, eh, just fair. The yeah. Terminal, just fair. War of the Worlds, eh, just fair. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. There's also yeah, the Adventures of movie. There's Adventures of Tintin, uh, Lincoln, War Horse. I mean, some of these are big award winners, but a lot of them are just like, I really don't care for any of these movies. They just never struck a chord with me. As a desire to see Bridge of Spies, never wanted to go see that movie. Ready Player One, didn't want to go see it in the movie theater. When we finally watched it again, you can draw a direct parallel between Ready Player One, Hook, and that scene that I described from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Just this tried to controlled chaos of just dumping all of this in, in your lap, trying to make it feel like a, a fleshed out world. But in the case of Hook and Ready Player One, it's... It's not. It just feels fake. It just, and in the case of Ready Player One, it is fake, right? Um, so I don't know. Steven Spielberg has his ups and downs, but man, those first, I don't want to say first 15 years because he was doing a lot of television stuff before Jaws came out and before Sugarland Express. But man, once Jaws came out, he rocketed for like 15 years of just some great movies that you will see. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to dismiss Schindler's List. I'm not trying to dismiss Jurassic Park or, or Lincoln or any of those other things. But just that run of just these are movies you have to go see because it has his name on it. That's the only reason why you're going to go see the movie. You don't care what that movie is about. It's by Steven Spielberg. And always, I know people give always a, a bunch of crap, but I love that movie. That is a fantastic little movie. But if it had Spielberg's name I like attached the to terminal. it, it's fine. It's just, I don't know. It's just weird. And, it, and, it, and really, and I don't know where... That may be where his love affair with Tom Hanks started, right? And awesome. then it just, and then they just keep doing movies and movies and movies together uh, back to back. I mean, everybody loves Tom Hanks. Oh, sure. I mean, That's yeah, true. no, but oh man, for 15 years, if it had Spielberg's name on it, it's like, I don't care what this movie's about. I'm sure. going to go see it because it's Steven Spielberg. And then, like I said, when Hook hit, I was kind of like, oh, I kind of see all of his tricks. I, he's opened the kimono one too many times and I'm no longer surprised. But still, he's got uh, more movies that I will watch again and again and again than anyone else on my list. So Steven Spielberg earns my top spot as my top five director. Matthew, who do you have for number one? I'm just disturbed at the thought of Steven Spielberg in a kimono. My number one is a director who has had huge influence on me, not just in terms of things that I reference, because frankly, I've been known to reference Freddy Got Fingered, and I hate that movie with a flaming passion. But no, in terms of the way I view filmmaking, the way I view how things are put together, and most importantly, the way I view what can you do when you have incredibly limited results, you have like no resources whatsoever, and what can you do? And in 1968, the answer to that was, I'm George Romero, I'm going to make the scariest movie you've ever seen for like $8, and we're going to call it Night of the Living Dead. And that movie really kind of shaped George Romero, because I don't know if you've seen the last few, I think he passed away actually, yeah, the last few films that he made were all in that reality, Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, Survival of the Dead, High School of the Dead. Uh, something, the of, something. The Dead Dark of the Side. Dead. Dead of the Dead, exactly. And then, of course, there was a remake of The Crazies, which, if you've ever seen The Crazies, is very much another take on the same themes of Night of the Living Dead. But I think, for me, what it really comes down to is, even in the most horrible things, whenever you are looking at something that Romero is doing, there's always this, this endless series of hope spots. And I feel like Night of the Living Dead is a resonant movie for me because no matter what happens throughout that movie, no matter how bad things get, 
there's always a little light at the end of the tunnel. And mm -hmm. then at the end, they extinguish it. So you, you get this thing where it feels like real life in, you know, in the messy, dirty kind of, you do your very, very best. You get really, really close and then everything falls apart. And not everybody can get away with that. I mean, not every storyteller can have an ending that goes that far afield. And if you've actually seen the remake of Night of the Living Dead that they did around 86, 87, 89, I don't know. Sometime, so it would have been college, it would have been the 90s. Uh, they did a remake of Night of the Living Dead with a very 90s twist. And it had a similar dark ending but it didn't work. And part of it, it for me didn't work was you get to the end of the original night of the living dead. And even though this terrible thing happens and then you get to sit there with the credits playing that just incredibly disturbing music and you get the, you know, the still shots of these terrible things happening and Romero just keeps stabbing you and stabbing you and stabbing you with the sadness fork that he keeps in his pocket. You I don't know. You feel somehow positive. You feel like I got through that. I lived through that experience, even though nobody else did. And that's kind of the thing that I always take away from every Romero experience is I feel at the end of a George Romero movie relieved that I lived. And that's not something that everybody can do. And as somebody who really likes horror, but has kind of a... Like I have little stomach for the Rob Zombie school of horror. Not that there's anything wrong, you know, with Gore. Not that there's anything like a Herschel Gordon Lewis. There's nothing wrong with blood and guts and spewing organs everywhere. That is a perfectly valid way to try and, you know, scare or draw in your your viewers. You know, there there's a whole school uh, that Bertolt Brecht thing of how do we alienate the audience as much as we can and then call it art. But there's something about a George Romero picture that is off-putting and alienating and somehow sweet and almost comforting, and yet also awful at the same time. Have you guys seen Creep Show? Yep. Oh, I'll have a go, yeah. Oh, I saw Creep Show when I was 12 years old. I, I saw think everybody Creepshow saw it when they were 12 years old. That's entirely possible. You and I got to see it the year it came out when we were 12 years old. Yeah, HBO I got to see or it Cinemax with, or something. With my friend, we called him the Stork. And everybody thought the stork had brain damage, and that's why they called him the stork. It's actually a line right. from uh, George, from... George Romero on, on your number one. So very oh, good. Oh, All good. right, listeners, I mentioned that uh, this top five came from our Discord channel. We do have a Discord channel, and you yeah. can go check that out. There's a link in the show notes. And Clever Lang, he's uh, head of the game over in our Discord uh, channel. The server is the uh, major spoiler server. It's in the Discord channel. Uh, he says, uh, my top five are Lucas, Spielberg, J.J. Abrams, Michael Bay, uh, and Sylvester Stallone. He also rans Burns, Shyamalan, Kevin Smith, Richard Donner, and Zack Snyder. Frank Burns? I, he doesn't say. He just says Burns. So it could be George Burns for all we know. I, I love Mr. Frank Burns. Burns. Could be Mr. Burns. Excellent. Um, listeners, if you have some top fives you would like to share with us, you can certainly head over to our Discord uh, server, or you can head over to Majorspoilers.com. Again, link in the show notes, and in the comment section for this episode, you can share your top five directors, and we'll read them, and maybe we'll read them on a future show. Who knows? But uh, everybody else will certainly read them, because everybody loves a list. This podcast is copyright 2019 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.